Okay, well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. As I said uh, earlier, we have a uh, pretty uh, international audience uh, registered for the uh, event this evening, and uh, glad, uh, glad to see that. Um, as, uh, as you know, our uh, presenter this evening is uh, Doug Weibel, uh, KR2Q, and Doug was first licensed in February 1966 as Whiskey November 2, Victor Yankee Alpha. Uh, he upgraded to General one week before his novice license expired. Despite logging less than one page of QSOs, he took to contesting after stumbling onto his uh, first one. He ended up contesting from home then, mostly uh, single band uh, 15 meters. Doug was later invited to uh, K2GL and 2AA to help out on 15, which uh, turned out to be his big break. That led to a 10-year run at the station, uh, mostly on 10 meters, and I can only hope, Doug, that conditions were better then than they are now on 10 meters. <laughs> Since then, uh, he's been operating uh, QRP from his home, racking up dozens of single off-ball band QRP wins in CQ Worldwide DX, CQ Worldwide WPX, and ARRL DX. Uh, his USA QRP records include uh, on sideband, uh, CQ Worldwide single off-ball band, CQ Worldwide single band on 15, 20, and 40. Uh, on CW, CQ Worldwide 15 and 20 meter single band, and uh, WPX uh, SSB uh, QRP single op all banned North America with 2.688 million. Uh, pretty uh, pretty impressive, Doug, especially uh, for uh, QRP. That's uh, uh, quite an accomplishment. Uh, as I uh, imagine many of you know, Doug has been a member of the CQ Worldwide Contest Committee uh, for over 30 years, and he also sponsors a couple of trophies, uh, the CQ Worldwide CW World Multi-Multi Trophy, CQ Worldwide CW USA Multi Single, the WPX uh, Single Sideband USA QRP Trophy, and the uh, Stu Perry Golden Log. So it's my pleasure uh, to uh, present uh, Doug's Weibel KR2Q, and uh, Doug, the floor is yours. Uh, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Ken. Is uh, am I coming through? You sound fine. Okay, great. All right, so uh, this is a presentation I originally did in Dayton uh, last year, 2008, and tonight uh, we have an expanded version. So for anybody who saw it uh, in 08, uh, you'll be seeing a fair amount of new material. And for everybody else, I hope you enjoy it. It's, uh, it's a look back at the history, and uh, uh, it's a lot of, I, I thought it was a lot of fun putting it together. It was a lot of work, and I, I hope everybody enjoys it. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Ken and the PVRC for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to show this uh, to a larger audience. And Okay, so my screen is click, not click moving. In, click inside your, uh, your application. Okay. And then... There we go. Thank okay. you, Ken. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, uh, so the presentation scope uh, is multi-op, multi-transmitter. Uh, USA only, 48 contiguous states. I, I had to limit it somehow, so this is what I picked. Uh, CQ Worldwide contests, uh, DX contest only. Uh, usually just the top 10, although you'll see later that I do include uh, certain parts further down than that. And this is just the quote early days uh, from the beginning through 1986. And um, so all the multi-multis that you hear about these days are not included. All right, these are the people who helped me uh, generate the material for this presentation. And uh, there's a lot of them, and I appreciate all their help. Um, I see Lamar is one of the uh, attendees here. He certainly helped out. And I think Fred Capasola is here as well, and I'm not sure who else. I didn't take a lot of time looking at the attendee list. But I sure do appreciate everyone's input. Okay, the K1VR also known as the excuse, and this is basically my acknowledgement that uh, I probably made some mistakes here, but that's okay. If you're wondering why it says the K1VR, when the CT program first came out, which was passed when all this stuff happened, uh, K1EA built into the program that if you entered as the entrant K1VR. At the end of the contest, you got an additional question that said, what's your excuse? So this is my excuse. Okay, first we're going to look at some of the uh, statistics. 
All right, and I do this in the form of quizzes. All right, CQ Worldwide began in 1948. So when was multi-multi formally sanctioned as a category of entry? And to make it less difficult, I've broken it down into uh, five categories. Uh, so we're not set up for everybody to actually vote. So just vote in your mind, and, uh, and we'll take it from there. So uh, I'll give everybody a couple minutes, or a couple seconds anyway, to think about this. And then we'll go to the answer. Okay, so the correct answer is C, and the year was actually 1959. And shown at the top of the page um, is an excerpt from the uh, CQ Worldwide Handbook that hardly anybody has, but I have one. And you can see highlighted here in blue, uh, rules in 1959, so a multi-operator category divided into two, due mainly to K2GL station and his enthusiasm. Uh, we now have multi-single and multi-multi. So 1959 was the year. All right, this is pre-multi-multi. This, uh, this is an excerpt from CQ Magazine for the uh, CW 1958 results. And I thought this was pretty funny. Uh, so K2GL had as many as four transmitters going at the same time. Uh, and the score on each band was equal to the, equal to the uh, leading single band. And then the question is, Buzz, are you going, and Buzz is uh, K2GL. So Buzz, are you going to have an electronic computer to keep score? This is 1958, so I thought that was uh, <laughs> good forecasting. And over on the left, we see the K2GL1 with uh, just barely over 2 million points, which now won't get you into the top 10 for uh, single op. But uh, things were different back then. Okay, quiz number two. From 1959 to 1986, which is our scope of uh, investigation, which call area never won the CQ Worldwide Multi-Multi? And uh, I left out the ones that I thought were obvious. Um, and these are your choices. Uh, Ken, uh, am I going through this at a good speed, or are yep, the slides uh, uh, that's lagging perfect. behind? Or? No, that's perfect, Doug. Uh, you're, you're doing okay. fine. All right. So, okay, so here are your choices, and the answer is, during the first 28 years, the first call area never won a CQ Worldwide multi-multi. That's mostly because there were no, no entrants, but uh, uh, I, I thought that was fascinating. Quiz three, who won the first CQ Worldwide multi-multi? And uh, I don't think anybody would ever get this. So here's the answer. W8NGO was the 1959 CQ Worldwide phone winner. I have no idea what happened to that station or that person. Okay, from 1959 to 1986, there were over 400 multi-multi entries for over 180 different USA stations, representing over 1,000 individual operator efforts. Quiz number four, in the first 28 years, how many different stations have won multi-multi? in CQ Worldwide. Remember, over 180 entered. And the answer is nine, which I found totally shocking. Uh, six stations have won on CW, and seven stations have won on phone. Not very many in 28 years. It's uh, pretty much dominated by a few. All right, and here are the winners uh, by year and mode. Uh, remember, we're stuck with the time frame 59 through 86. Um, so here are the years spread out left to right. I guess this is sort of a stem and leaf diagram, uh, if you want to take it that way. And um, anytime you see uh, uh, a year in red, that means they won both modes. So here, here are the guys. And uh, I had certainly never heard of W3AOH, so that was quite a surprise when I put this together. All right, and then here's a list of uh, what I call consistent multi-multi entrants, people who are just always in it or seem to always be in it uh, during this time frame. On the left, we have the CW entries, and on the right, the phone entries. And I try to line it up uh, according to uh, activity from top to bottom. Now, one thing I found, uh, I don't know, does my cursor show up on the screen? Yep, sure does. Okay. 
So one, one thing I found out is that over here, K3WW and W3FRY, these are actually the same station. So these two lines belong together, but that was too late, and I never went back to correct it. So this actually belongs up here somewhere. So my apologies to, uh, to uh, K3WW and, and his ops. All right, so this is a very interesting, uh, very interesting group. Uh, we've got uh, the coast covered. And uh, and over here, N5AU. Um, and here's this W8NGO who won the first contest. We see they were very active on phone, and I guess they didn't know the code. And W6RW, they seem to have had the reverse problem. Okay, here are the scores. Uh, left side, sideband. Right side, CW. And uh, you can see at the very top left, NGO won multi-multi with 82,000 points. Uh, but they did continue for a number of years. And I mean, there's you know a couple guys stuck in in, in here and there. There's a you know W7RM and W3WJD. But, uh, and in yellow, we've got the uh, the big the high score for this whole series of years. So 13 million was the high score in this entire time frame on phone, and 10 million with uh, W2PV, Jim Lawson, had the high score in that same time frame. Okay, so let's let's get our mind back into uh, uh, into the setting of 1959. All right, so these are the ads that were in the magazines. So on the left, we had the 1959 version of a uh, switching diode. <laughs> and on the right, uh, the prices for the quad. And for those of you who uh, are not back from these days or a little bit later, the, uh, the Dow key relay was how you switch the antenna from the transmitter to the receiver. Couldn't live without it. Here's some more ads. Get yourself a uh, tower for 50 bucks or a Vibraplex from the actual Vibraplex company, not the resold, resold one. 24 karat gold plated, $29.95. This was a, uh, actually I still have one of these. So do so I. The, uh, the DA I'm sorry? I said so do I. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, this is the DX Edge and this is a piece of plastic. And uh, this, yeah, you had one for each month, this little piece here. And this would slide back and forth when you pushed it with your fingers. And the background just stayed fixed. And, and it was a pretty neat tool. It was very handy. Uh, we also had to figure out where to point the antennas. And this is from 1984 from uh, K1KI, Tom Frenet. This is a product that uh, he marketed that people actually used. And then the DX Edge went electronic. I don't know how many people remember a Commodore 64. But uh, this was uh, $34.95, not a bad price. And of course, it's the new, faster version. All right, now the fun part uh, are the pictures. And as it says, in no particular order. All right, so this is 1959. And this is the only photo I found of this multi-multi uh, station, W3AOH. And I, uh, I pulled this out of an old CQ magazine. Um, K3DKD. All right, this is uh, the location of W6RW, 1962. It's uh, in multi multi a lot. Kind of an interesting looking location. And uh, telephone poles instead of towers. And uh, uh, nice monobanders. As we go through these slides and you see monobanders, uh, you'll notice that everyone had big monobanders back then. Uh, the only thing that was really different then from now is uh, uh, the spacing. And here's a, uh, a nice group photo from 6RW in 1961. Where she got uh, nice rigs in the background. And uh, uh, if you look carefully to the right uh, in front of the rig, you'll see a pair of headphones that, boy, they can't be comfortable for very long. And I presume over on the left is uh, one of their homebrew amps. All right, and here's uh, another 6RW shot, a uh, slightly younger Dick Norton. 
Uh, for those of you who've seen Dick lately and his work in uh, ARRL and QST, you can uh, do a comparison. Still looks like him. And let's see what else. Oh yeah, on top of the uh, on top of the rig on the right uh, over here. This was universal. This is called a time meter. This was a clock, a, a quote digital clock. These were drums that rotated around, and that's how we all kept time. And of course, you see Dick is using a paddle and uh, has paper for logging. And I'm not sure why he needs a call book there. I never noticed that before. Maybe he can explain that. All right, and here's a nice trophy shot with the radio from uh, 6RW. And here's another shot with some more folks that uh, we're familiar with from the last couple of years, all the way back. Uh, of course, Phil, it's uh, SK now, and uh, Dick Norton, and Glenn Ratman, who I think is on the line here also. Um, and as you can see, lots of paper, lots of pencils, lots of paddles. And some more guys. And all the way in the back, you see the, the classic sending while holding the pencil in the hand. Uh, I used to do that a lot. People would come by and just marvel at it. And I was like, well, how else do you do it? All right, now we're going to transition over to uh, W3AU at Bissell's place. Originally W3MSK. And we, uh, we're going to see a lot of repetition of different kinds of rigs throughout all these stations. These were the, uh, the hot radios back then. And again, the time meter up here, how you tell time. And these are the black and whites that are uh, pulled from their website. So uh, I presume those are monoband amps on the left. And uh, over on the right, W3IN, later W4IN. Uh, I believe he ran the 160 contest for a long, long time. There's Don Search on 15. Sorry for the graininess. And over on the right, it's, uh, EST, Bob Cox on 20CW. Uh, he looks very relaxed for it being a contest, but uh, whatever. And here, here's another big difference with the quality of the chairs. Look at that chair on 10 meters and the chair Bob is sitting in. I, I can't imagine doing 48 hours in one of those. And here's the wall of amps. And 10 element 10. Now, if any of these... Uh, if any of these descriptions are incorrect, uh, this is what was handed to me. So, uh, 10 element 10, way back then, uh, 10 element 10, and I think it's still a big antenna. And 5 element 40. And 7 element 15. So, so all the antennas that you think about today that are, wow, this guy's got a huge antenna. Uh, they were around a long time ago, although... Well, not too many of them are stacked. 7 element 20. Some more inside shots. Actually, I think the one on the left is a dupe, so the, those are the amps. Nice portrait, a little bit grainy. Well, very grainy. Here's a closer picture of Don. Looks just like him. And uh, as usual, you see the Budweiser... Uh, carrying case on the top left. Okay, so this is pulled off the website. It says 3AU, but it's 1969, so it's really W3MSK. And we see the, uh, the classic Collins gear. And I'm looking for the clock, but I don't see it in the picture. All right, some more familiar calls if, uh, if you're a history buff. And uh, some great classic rigs. It's a close-up of Bob Cox. And there's a great picture of the clock. Uh, right there. And there's, a, I guess, one of the ungrainy pictures. 
relatively speaking. And again, you'll notice that uh, there's no keyboards, there's no computers, and there's lots of paper. Interesting uh, shot up the tower. There's Don Search again on the. Uh, I believe I believe I was told this is on 160. So uh, keep this in mind as we go through all these different stations that uh, the 160 ops all seem to have this in common. So again, we see the, uh, the clock over here, rotor indicator, paper. This is uh, actually looks like a dupe sheet. Paper dupe sheets. There's a nice group photo. That's the other kind of clock, the big thing on the wall. And uh, distant view of the towers and from across the Potomac. Okay, next we're uh, going to go to W4BVV, which starts out with a uh, little music. <laughs> Okay, so now everybody knows why the scores weren't as big as they are today. It took a long time to call CQ. And here's a, a shadow shot of the station. And here's some of the ops. And uh, I really love some of the stuff in here. Got this nice big speaker at the top of the picture. I, I don't know if this is a reserve tube in case they blow one up or if this one's already dead. And uh, a Drake rig, Collins rigs, and uh, I don't know about everybody else. I remember this call, usually portable too. And uh, here are the teenagers, uh, Dick Norton and Gene Zimmerman. Maybe they're a little bit older here, I'm not sure. But uh, classic shot. We see Dick got to operate on both coasts. And another picture, the monoband amps, great telephone. And I'm not sure, but uh, reportedly this gentleman is a blind op, and this is a Braille writer. I don't know if that's accurate or not. But, uh, that's one of the stories I've been told. And a color photo of the amps. And at the bottom left, we see an SB220. I presume that's a standalone and not driving anything. And a, uh, a later shot of Gene Zimmerman, uh, W3ZZ. And uh, oh, uh, by the way, both Dick, and, uh, both Dick and Gene are still members of the CQ uh, contest committee. Kind of neat. Right, nice clean desk. Uh, great, great way to operate. Uh, Frank Donovan later told me that these are not 200-foot towers. Uh, when I got the photo, they were labeled twin 200-foot towers. <laughs> so uh, apparently Frank uh, did the calculations, counting sections or something, and apparently they're a little bit shorter than that. But still, uh, still an all-nice antennas. And... Uh, I presume once they put the uh, strut wires on, the boom straightens out a little bit. But we've all we've all been through this sort of thing, and I believe that's it up in the air. And still a little saggy, but not bad. Uh, this is one of the early W1 multi multis, and this this station's like a real mystery. Uh, apparently, they were on rather competitive for one year, and then they disappeared. And the, uh, I don't know, the owner of the station went to Australia or something and sort of fell off the face of the earth. Um, but it was nice to be able to get a photo. And another person, uh, this is a Heath Kit multi-multi. Uh, well, we've got the SB line and another Heath Kit uh, to the right. Again, we've got the, uh, the, the clock over here, the Halicrafters HA1 TO Kier. A tube keyer. I think we, uh, anyone who's my age or older, had one of these. 
And uh, another shack here. Uh, we were not sure who the guy in the top right was. So I wrote, and they thought it might be Rusty, W6OAT. So I wrote to Rusty. I sent him a copy of the picture. And this is what he sent back at the bottom. And uh, he, he says, yeah, that's me. And he believes he was, <laughs> he came down from school. He got invited. And you can read this on your own. And this is a picture of him that he believes his very first multi-multi. Just kind of a really neat picture to have. Um, someone who's been in it all these years. Right, and some nice shots of the backs of the head. But uh, again, we can see how multi-multis were set up. Lots of people. Again, we got the, uh, the wonderful ergonomic chairs. We got uh, beach, beach folding chairs. I can't imagine how they did that. Uh, or a school chair. I guess, I don't know what's on the right. Is that the back of a leather chair? All right, and here's another shot with the Heath Kit equipment. And now we're going back to the West Coast. W6, very strong signal. Uh, this, this picture is obviously backwards if you read the, uh, what's up here, sun and earth. Um, but uh, I'm not, I, my, my talent with, uh, with my photo equipment wasn't, good enough to, uh, to flip it around so it stayed the way I got it. So this is Dale, Dale Hoppy, and uh, this thing it looks like a fan for those who don't know. This is a Selson. This is how you could tell where the, uh, where the antenna was pointed. And I'm sure on the other side is a pointer. No idea what kind of microphone that is. And even better is the microphone stand. But again we see the dupe sheet, the paper dupe sheet. And uh, Collinears, I, I think these are 5x5 five five on 10 meters. It's a nice setup. I don't know how they got it up there, but it's uh, pretty neat looking. And a 5-element uh, 40. Still a big antenna today. 5 over 5 on 20 on a, uh, on a big Bertha. Always pretty to look at. And in the middle is, I'm not sure what that is, 2.5 elements on 15 or 10. All right, this is, uh, this is pulled out of CQ Magazine, so uh, hence the graininess. This is also pulled out of CQ Magazine, and we've all been through this who've been in contests where you, you do your best and you get on, and uh, before the advent of 3830 being a, uh, an Internet site, uh, 3830 was a real frequency, and we all got on and shared our scores, or got on the telephone, or something like that. And uh, I know we've all experienced thinking you did really well, and then you get on, and everything is dashed. And there's always next year. All right, then over to uh, W7RM, also on the West Coast, uh, Rush Drake. And the kid in the left is Danny Ashkenazi. And uh, these are actually pictures taken from a newspaper, so again, the extreme grain. And I uh, apologize for that again. And the, the house and some of his antennas, 5 over 5 on 10, very clean, 6 over 6 on 20, 6 over 6 on 15. And you notice the, uh, the sidearm mount from way back when, which uh, a lot of people still use today. And the 4 element 40. That's also big. This is kind of neat. This is uh, 2 element 80. Mostly wire, except for the boom. It's an incredible boom to be holding up uh, wire and then some aluminum pieces hanging off the end. Really... Uh, I, I can't imagine how they got this thing up in the air. And this is from uh, Russia's place to Europe and to Japan. Very pretty. And Gene Zimmerman in Rush. Uh, I know we said continental United States, but I felt sorry for Rich, so I stuck this in. I'm not sure of the year, but it's obviously uh, at least a couple of years back. 
All right, back to the East Coast. This is uh, uh, SIG, W3WJD, now N3RS. Uh, and again, Collins Gear, Homebrew Amps on the left. And lots of spaghetti. All right, one of his towers. And I guess this is two meter stuff hanging off the side. And at the bottom is his TV antenna. And uh, this is the bottom of a vertical, I suppose, running from here up. And lots of elevated radials coming off. Wonder how it worked. Looks pretty neat. Two element 40, six element 10. This is on the inside. And 3 rs W3XU, who I actually went to school with at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. We were both in grad school back then. And uh, he was at Wharton, and uh, I was at the veterinary school, and we ran into each other at the radio club, didn't know who each other were, we had never met. We started talking, and we found we both liked contesting. We finally said, who are you? And we almost fell down. That's kind of neat. Another picture of the house with the antennas. All right, and up to... Uh, Jim Lawson's place. Now this is the inside of uh, Jim Shack, uh, pair of alphas and a uh, pair of signal ones. This is Jim. For those of you who don't recognize this person, this is K1AR, John Doerr. And a uh, shot of the 40 and 15 meter positions. This is uh, this is a great shot. I love this. This is a picture of K1EA, the guy who popularized CT, the logging program almost everybody used initially, and uh, here he is holding a pencil. I uh, I just love it. It's probably why he wrote CT. And uh, K1DG and XA on 15, and uh, nice neat setup. Everything was always very very organized. Jim had a reputation for being meticulous about all this stuff. Chairs still don't look very ergonomic. And over here on the left, this was uh, PV's uh, mult passing system. This is a CB radio that they used. I, I understand all the guys were set up in different rooms or uh, upstairs or downstairs or something, and that's how they communicated. Kind of neat idea. Here's K3LR uh, a few years back. And this is uh, Jim's Big Bertha. And this three over three stack. So uh, they had big antennas for a long time. This is uh, Joe Crone at uh, Jim Lawson's place, WA2SPL. And uh, I guess they didn't like the Sigma ones anymore, so they put them on the side. It's kind of a neat picture for Sigma ones. All right, over to uh, Gordon Fox's place. So here we have very familiar calls. Uh, N5KO, K5ZD, W5FO, I think is uh, recently passed. Again, these just look like unbearable chairs to be sitting in, but hey, when when we were young back then, who cared, right? All right, now this is a picture tuning up the amp. I understand they called it the heart-lung machine. Uh, Here's a, uh, another picture of the 160 guy. Uh, here's Gator doing his thing, uh, probably after, uh, it's probably sun up, and, uh, and that's what he's left with. And here's a uh, nice shot across you know, with an unknown operator. All right, N5TR. I, I, you got to love the creativity on the boom mic here. I don't know if it's a cane or the bottom of an umbrella, but uh, <laughs> whatever works. And and here we see a keyboard. That's the first time. All right, and here's a uh, a great shot. I just love this picture of uh, in 5AU. Too bad it's in Texas. <laughs> all right, here's Randy having a great time. Of course, this is what it's all about for contesting is having fun. Uh, never lose sight of that. And another shot of the 
5 AU station. And here's a great picture. Over here it says, more malts, call CQ. You have a titanic signal. Uh, uh, they will answer soon. <laughs> so you have a titanic signal that will answer soon. I guess that's encouragement that you need from Texas when you're uh, fighting the uh, left and right coasts. And here's, here's, a here's the amp. And here's a close-up of the amp. So we can see that uh, they sort of ran out of room on the meter. So uh, they're putting every watt to good use. There's, uh, I think, the BTI standing up in the center again. And the alpha with the red buttons pushed in. We all ended up doing that eventually. Uh, here we are back to paper. And this was a, a big leap in technology. We went from using pencils to uh, using lead pencils. It seems so simple, but uh, I don't know why. Everybody seemed to use a paper a pencil with an eraser. All right, think loud, be loud, one call. And uh, instead of instant messaging or talking to each other by typing on the keyboard, use post-its. And this says, if you get C21NI, say, operate split frequency. I don't know what band, but maybe it's uh, 40. <laughs> Pretty funny. All right, and uh, this is the last station we're going to look at, it's uh, K2GL. K2GL uh, has won more multi-multis than anyone else, so they have a lot more slides. I also operated there for 10 years, so I had access to more pictures. I promise you I did not include all the pictures I had, even though it might seem that way. All right, so this is the, uh, this is the house. We call it the hill. He, uh, he's on top of a uh, hill in New York. And that's, uh, that's the north face uh, looking southward. And, uh, whoops, and this, this is a uh, 5 element 15 uh, on the chimney. And uh, it's hard to tell perspective here, but this thing, I think, is it like at 70 feet? It's, uh, it's way up in the air. All right, we're going back to way back when. So W2IWC, Fred. Uh, this is W2SKE, uh, Bill Leonard. Of course, uh, the league now has a, uh, some sort of award they give out annually for Bill Leonard. Um, hard to believe they called this desktop, but they did. It's a massive piece of equipment. And uh, over here we have the, the classic bird plunger switches. So you pick these up and you turn them 90 degrees or however many degrees and push them back down. And that's how you change your antennas. Um, and here we see Bill wearing a jacket and an ascot. So I guess contesting was a lot different back then. Here's a great picture of Buzz at the radio, uh, which is kind of rare. He really didn't operate too much. And another picture of uh, Mr. Capicella, today being very un-PC with the cigarette, but... Um, and uh, we can see tuning the, uh, the latest in Collins transceivers on the, uh, on the left hand there. Horrible picture, but uh, in quality, but includes some neat calls, so I left it in anyway. Uh, another shot of Buzz. This is uh, Lamar, who's also on the uh, webinar tonight. And this is uh, an overexposed shot of the shack. And over here on the left, an HX50 was used on 160. It ran 50 watts, which I think they could only run during the evening. I think during the day they had to turn it down. And uh, Henry 2K amps, Collins. There's uh, 1966. This is uh, K2KUR with his aliases. And... Uh, Gene always said, where did you get this picture? I have hair. <laughs> so he, I don't know, somebody sent it to me. <laughs> but uh, great shot. Again, the Hallcrafters T.O. Keir. This is kind of a rare radio, Esquire Sanders SS1R. And, of course, the classic Collins equipment. All right, here's a picture of Fred with, I think, a visiting Yankee Victor. This is a 40-meter beam that came down. And over here in the background, this is a, a 
I believe a stack house tower. So uh, remember this tower for later. That's that's what it looked like then. Another inside shot from uh, the late 60s. And again here on the bottom left we have the uh, clock, Collins gear, pair of uh, 2Ks. This is the 40 meter position at uh, K2GL. This is uh, K2TT, Bill Schneider. Another classic shot. Uh, Fred over here, XYL number one, K2TT, and uh, W1GYE. This is uh, Dale, uh, VQ9QM, for those of you who needed that for a country at some point, operating. And this is a 15 meter position. And there's the Squire Sanders on the bottom right again. Kind of a neat radio. These two buttons here, one on the left and one on the right, you push these in, and he was, he, the, the dial was motorized, and it goes zzz, 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 back and forth. I don't know anybody who actually used it, but it was fun to play with. All right, 1969, a storm came through, ripped the station apart, and K2GO was QRT until 75. And then the new crew came in. This is a picture of me wearing a Signal 1 shirt. This is a K2XR. Dave Franks, he later went to, uh, a lot of you probably worked him from HZ and Alpha Papa. And here we can see we're up to uh, TR7s and uh, baby uh, Alpha amplifiers. This is uh, 10 meters. This is 160 with a signal 1 and a, and a bigger. I believe this is actually a PA70V uh, that was owned by the operator. And here we are. Okay, N2AA here. K1KI here, this is the 20 meter position. And this is a TR7 uh, Collins. And uh, the other interesting thing on phone is we all use these goosenecks, took off lots of desk space, uh, which was critical because we needed all these dupe sheets. Boom mics were not heard of. Another shot of the shack. Uh, we have Richard King, K5NA back here. Interesting story with Richard King. Uh, uh, Buzz liked his voice so much, also being from the South, that uh, he tape recorded it. And uh, during the day, we called CQVE on uh, 160, 80, and 40, all using K5NA's voice. It's <laughs> pretty neat. Uh, another shot looking down on 80 meters, K2NG, who now is at uh, PJ4G a lot, and uh, K2UR. This is me back here on 40. Um, and again, you can see we have desk mics, very different dupe sheets or paper. This big thing is the, uh, the Selson for the 80 meter rotator. And this is, uh, this is 40 meters in the front, 10 meters in the back, and just a vast array of equipment. Old Collins, newer Collins, still a time meter clock, Whole Crafters uh, Keir, Curtis Keir, Drake TR7, Drake, I don't know, what's it say, R4, R4B, Alpha, this is a Raycal uh, receiver. One year a bunch of those floated in and uh, for one contest and came out the next day. Uh, Henry 2K amp, and again, lots of paper. Another shot behind the scenes. Picture of uh, KY2P back then, now W4PA, I think most people know Scott. Also operated with us on uh, operating here with Gene on 20. Dave Donnelly, K2SS on 15. And again, another uh, another emphasis on paper. So here we have the uh, bottom left, the uh, the KI tool, uh, log sheets, dupe sheet. What a pain in the neck that stuff was. Same thing here again on 15 with uh, now W5OV. This is a dupe. Sorry about that. Uh, and this is one of the neat things about doing multi-ops is uh, everybody gets to become real chummy and uh, have a lot of fun together. It's a great social atmosphere. Everybody still talks to everybody. Okay. Now, in this picture, uh, this is 80 again, but the key here is over on the bottom right, a pencil sharpener. 
And yes, we actually used the pencil sharpener. <laughs> All right, again, having a good time. Everybody relaxing, even though it's in the middle of the contest. Uh, you need to take a break now and then. And this is not during the contest, but uh, in prep preparation for. So we have Susan King on the left, uh, Buzz, uh, JL1BLW, who uh, I think now works for NTV, uh, Scott, and Gene. Here's Bob having a great time. Here's another 160 shot. This is Susan and Richard King. If you look out of the window here, it's daylight, so we understand why, why they are in that position. And uh, K5NA and K2UR. K2UR is on 80, so again, it must be daytime. Now, this is uh, some neat shots. This is one year we had a blackout toward the end of the contest, I think the last four hours. So on the left, in the red circle, you'll see Buzz is holding a candle. Uh, it's Dave Donnelly on the right looking asleep. And here you can see the uh, candelabra. These are real candles. This is not electric. Uh, we had no power at all. This is a picture of me. We were all sitting there wondering what to do. Just before the power went out, I was all set to call a new molt. And uh, then the power went out, and everybody was going frantic. And K2NG ran to his car, pulled out the battery. We ripped apart the TR7 wired it up to the battery, only to realize that we didn't have a keyer. So I took the, uh, the paddle, and we rewired that, and held it sideways. And we all took turns working JAs with a battery. The chirp was unbelievable. We, we worked the 5W1 on one call with uh, battery power, obviously uh, barefoot. A uh, picture of Bill and CQVE. We've all done that. Uh, another picture of the Kings. Uh, this is Tom Wall, K2TW, and this little box he's carrying is a TDR, Time Domain Reflectometer, I think it's called. And when you have thousands of miles of coax and all of a sudden something doesn't work, you've got to figure out where it is. Boy, that's a great tool. Everybody who's got lots of coax needs one of those. Uh, again, the paper. You can see my comment, UG. Uh, this is uh, 9M6NA, Sati, and this is our copier. And I thought this was a really neat photo because you did not want to run out of log sheets during a contest. Here's that tower that I said to remember before. It's, uh, it's broken off uh, after the storm. And here we are replacing tower. So this is uh, row number 80. The stuff is 500 pounds a section. And uh, the gin pole, which you see here, this is our Roan 55. That's our gin pole. All right, here's the uh, Roan 80 completed. Uh, this is actually 160 feet of it. And this is putting up the uh, first rotating tower in the States for uh, contesting. It might be the first rotating tower in the States, period. I'm not sure. But uh, uh, it, was a, it was a lot of fun. When this was going up like this, this thing was so well balanced that uh, as, as you took a step, the whole thing would spin. It was very, very difficult to climb, which is why you see all these yellow ropes. Those are not to keep it up in the air. Those are to prevent it from spinning. It's a Telrex 10 Element 10. Of course, Telrex was the uh, classic antenna back then if you weren't building your own. And here's the uh, finished rotating tower, 10 over 10 on 10. Uh, this was my idea. Everybody, uh, everybody except Buzz laughed at it. They thought it would never work. And uh, K2SS actually uh, had the fortitude to go ahead and, and uh, put the thing up. Another picture of a 10 element 10. This is a different tower. This is uh, what we ended up with on the 80 meter, on the uh, Roan 80 tower. This is uh, 3 element 80. This is a modified Telrex. Um, this is a Roan 45, I think. Maybe it's 55. This was being used to hold catenary lines. And one day we looked at it and said, what a waste. And we put up uh, a four stack of fives fixed on Africa on 15. Worked real well. Big Bertha. Everybody had Big Berthas back then. This is the bottom of a Big Bertha, if you've never seen it. Uh, pretty big gears. That's my hand. I still have all five fingers. Uh, this is an eight element 15 out in the garden. A K2GL is uh, spread out over. Lots of land. Um, 
I'm not sure how much land we had. I know I know uh, Buzz owns 1,700 acres in the park. We sure weren't spread out that far. Uh, this is one of the ideas we tried. Uh, this is uh, a 24 element array on 15. This is the bottom half of it. So this is six collinear six, and further up was another one. This is uh, after a storm, and everything sort of got banged around and messed up, and the light duty KLMs were not a good idea for this location. This is what we replaced it with. These are uh, five element Telrexes. Again, same configuration. This is how we turned it. This thing would, the, the whole thing would actually turn from Europe to Japan. Uh, this is uh, Gene Walsh's son, Bobby. And uh, we'd call out and, and say, Japan's coming in, turn the antennas. And we had all these winching systems going up and down, and he would let out one and take in the other, and the whole thing would swing around from one place to the next. It was fine for Japan. It was really way too narrow for, uh, for Europe. Uh, this is a view from on top of the house. And I like this picture because these are two-meter boomerang antennas. And this is toward the, uh, toward the end of the operation. And uh, this is when Packet first started. And when the Frankfurt Radio Club, who was down in Pennsylvania, and we were up in New York State, uh, we wanted to listen to what they were passing for Malt. So we put this up, and we heard them really well. They got kind of annoyed. They went QRP, and we still heard them. Um, and then up to the north from PV's area, they had packet going on Mount Greylock, and we, we checked into that. It was not real reliable. We had to reconnect about every four minutes. This is the final configuration for the Roan 80 on the left. Uh, so at the, very, here, at the very top is 3 element 80. This is 200 feet. Uh, 200 feet of tower sitting on top of a 70-foot ridge. And then these are uh, 6 element Telrexes of 4 stack. One, two, three, and the bottom one's right there. Over here is uh, another Roan 80 tower, 160 feet, three over three on 40. Um, this is the top of the 10 over 10 rotating. This is the 10 element 10 in the driveway. This is part of the two meter boomers. This is what it looks like on top of a 200 foot tower on top of a 70 foot ridge. So this is K2NG. And uh, yeah, we actually do solder, not we, he. Uh, you have to solder up there when something breaks. And that's what the foliage looks like in New York at, uh, at getting ready for uh, CQ Worldwide. And here's another picture. This is the mast, uh, that rusty thing. Down in the bottom left is a neat picture. Uh, you can see all this little tiny detail in here. So this thing, this brown thing, is a telephone pole. And it's, uh, I don't know if it's 90 or 100 feet, but it's got 8 over 8 on 15 fixed on Europe. Uh, this is the 10 element 10 on the driveway tower with a 2 element 40 below it, fixed on South America. And this tower we call the pool tower, 6 element 20 on top, another 10, 10 element 10 fixed on Europe. So there's a 10 element 10 here um, and a 10 element 10 here. And these, again, are the stacked eights. Oh, and there's the uh, chimney tower, the 5 element 15. So a lot of hardware down there. This is looking at the boom. Uh, I think this is looking, uh, this is looking south, I believe. Uh, so this is the 80 meter boom. Down on the bottom left, you can see the top of the 10 element 10. Over here on the right, this is the garden tower with another another tower with 8 over 8 on 15. This is a 200-foot Roan 45. This has a pair of 5-element 10-meter beams, relatively low, aimed south. That's Caribbean. And then a pair of shorty 40s stacked, uh, also low, fixed south. Uh, and this is on top of the, uh, the big Roan 80 looking down on the little Roan 80. So this is 160 feet of tower. Is a stack three element 40s, full size 40s, and uh, you can just see how tiny everything starts to look. All right, this is the top of the 80. This is the uh, or top of the Roan 80. This is the 80 meter rotator. Pretty pretty big stuff. The rotator weighed 750 pounds. It uh, it was professionally hauled up the tower. And this is uh, looking back on uh, the station, uh, Tuxedo Lake in the background. Here's uh, the Bertha, 
We didn't talk about this. This is called the B tower. The set of three element, 40, a high gain 40, uh, 403B. These are amazing. These have like, I don't know, 20 tapers per element, and they, they have like one inch sag. They're unbelievable. And again, you can see the nice fall foliage. And all good things come to an end, including the webinar. And uh, this will be posted. You guys can read this at your leisure. And uh, I'll leave this up, and uh, it's probably, uh, Ken, a good time to take questions. Yep, sure is. Okay, very good. You know, it's interesting. Uh, back then, what uh, was considered pushing the envelope of multi-transmitters and how today it's just uh, accepted uh, part, uh, part of contesting. Okay, folks, uh, question time. Uh, again, if uh, you want to type in a question, you can do so uh, from the control panel. There's a questions pane. If you can't find your control panel, uh, the little rectangular grab tab on the very top, there's a double arrow, click that, and the bigger uh, control panel should show up. And if you have a microphone connected and you want to ask a question, uh, click the little raise your uh, hand icon and I'll uh, call you and uh, unmute your microphone and uh, you can go ahead with your question. Um, have a couple of uh, notes here, uh, Doug, from uh, Howie N4AF. And uh, maybe one slide had uh, Don N4IN listed as W4IN. Uh, oh, sorry. Point, pointed that out. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Why is that not taking? Uh, W1 Bravo Golf Delta, he also mentioned, I believe, is uh, W1RM today. Alrighty. And. Okay. Go ahead and send that. Uh, Randy K5ZD says, great uh, job, Doug. And uh, I would uh, second that. Thanks, Randy. And let's see. N5LUL says, interesting. Thank you. All right. Okay, let's see if we've got anyone who uh, wants to ask a question. Uh, the microphone? Nope, I guess not. Okay, well, I am going to uh, scroll down. We've got some more uh, comments and questions coming in, so I will uh, take these. Uh, okay, lots of uh, lots of kudos, Doug. And uh, <laughs> K0DQ says, uh, good stuff. Uh, we were uh, we were really that young, question mark. <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, go ahead. I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. <laughs> I think I was in high school when uh, I, I used to work, Scott, every day on 15 or or at least every weekend. And, uh, yeah, XC1IIJ, a great time. <laughs> Good memories. Okay, uh, Fred, K6, sugar, sugar, sugar. Great job, Doug. Nice to see some old uh, FRCers. I think that was from Fred. Okay, also uh, another one from Fred Bravo. Doug, I'll be sending you a DVD shortly. All right, as long as no one's sending me a subpoena. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see here. Lot, uh, uh, lots of kudos, uh, Doug, and uh, one uh, no such thing as uh, too many antennas. I agree with that. Let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, John and I, uh, John, I, uh, I apologize. I forget your new call. WB2EKK. <laughs> Any uh, picture of the uh, pictures of the old CQ wheels? I'm not sure uh, what those were. Maybe you recall, Doug? Uh, we, n I, not that I'm aware of. Um, I do remember seeing CQ strips where they'd have plates across, uh, you know, straight across. Now I've never seen a wheel. If you, if you have a picture, send me a picture. And 4NW is wondering what happened to all those uh, Telrex beams. Maybe Tom wants to put them up. <laughs> uh, when when K2GL was dismantled, um, most of the stuff on the inside went to Georgia Tech. Uh, was donated there, and I think uh, I think it ended up with JPD, and then I'm not sure where it went from there. The uh, the, the Telrex antennas. Um, what did happen to those? Uh, some of them, some of the stuff uh, K2NG took, 
Uh, we, you know, nobody had place to put all this. We couldn't even store it. We didn't have that much property. Uh, K2NG had picked up some land, so I know the uh, I know the big Bertha went to K2NG. I think some of the Telrec stuff went there. I I, I know the ten element ten, ten element ten meter beams went there, um, but I, I'm not sure if he ever put it up. Uh, I haven't been in his place in probably 15 or 20 years. At that time, everything was still on the ground, so uh, it's hanging out somewhere. Okay, uh, Joe says, great job. I got my start in contesting in 75, so newbie compared to these guys. Um, but of the uh, multi-multi stations, were, in, were there any on the Midwest? And I think uh, some of the first slides you showed with uh, uh, the different stations in the years they were active, I believe, had uh, some Midwest stations. Is that right? Well, there was W8NGO, actually won the first one, and they continued to be active on phone. Um, no, I don't. I don't. I don't know. Again, you know, I limited the scope to the uh, to top ten guys, so that uh, kind of cut a lot of people out. Okay. You know, I I guess I could do it again for everybody, but uh, that that'd be a long webinar. <laughs> All right. W4MYA says thanks. Uh, K4ZA history made fun. Uh, truly, super stations with super guys. Uh, agreed. Let's see. Uh, N4JOW is an excellent dog. Um, okay. Uh, Jose uh, wants to know uh, why you uh, quit doing multi multi and started QRP. Oh, well, after I left Buzz's, uh, uh, what did we do? We went, to, uh, we went to K5NA. Richard King had a place in upstate New York, and we were, quote, trying it out. And, uh, um, it was it was further for us to travel. Most of us were a lot of us were from New Jersey, and uh, Richard was up uh, around Kingston, and uh, and he had a pesky noise level that was really horrible, um, and I don't know it just didn't work out up there, and uh, you know so <laughs> I you know. When when you when you leave a giant multi multi and you come home, what are you going to do? You know, there's no way you can try to compete to get that that thrill back. So, I tried QRP and I've just been having fun with it. And uh, uh, I don't know. I guess I guess I could uh, I could move back into multi multi quite easily. But uh, you get married, you get kids, it, it becomes more difficult. You got to remember. Almost all of us up there were, uh, were either single or if we were married, we were newly married with no kids. So uh, it, it made spending 300 hours a summer away from home relatively easy. <laughs> yeah, you've done pretty well in QRP, too. Okay, uh, K4ZA said uh, QST ran a picture of uh, Vic Clark uh, W4KFC's CQ wheel in 64-65. Uh, Let's see. Uh, George is wondering, is the K2GL house still in existence? That would be cool to see it on Google Earth. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's still in existence, and it's very visible on Google Earth. Uh, there's, there's still two, there's, both Rhone 80 towers are still up. And if, uh, if anybody has the opportunity to drive north on the New York State Thruway, when you go past the Slotesburg overpass, there's a walkover if you look. Look up to the uh, straight ahead of you. You'll see both Rhone 80 towers, and there's certain parts where you can look backwards and see them from another angle. Um, the uh, I guess nobody wanted to take those down. They uh, the estate ended up donating them to the town of Tuxedo Park, so they've got their ambulance and police radio on them. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't see any hands raised. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, as far as asking uh, questions with the. Microphone. Um, Glenn K6 NA says, "Hi Doug. Uh, I think the first picture ID of W3AZD at W3MSK might have been wrong. Looks like Charlie Weir W6 Hotel Oscar Hotel W6UM to me. Also, yes, uh, K3NPV was indeed a blind operator. I'll pass that along. Okay, Glenn, could you uh, could, could you send me an email so I can get correction on that one photo? Thank you. Alrighty." Uh, K0DQ again, uh, other than Dale Hoppy, did anyone ever get busted for power that you know of? 
<laughs> Other than Dale Hoppy that I know of, no. <laughs> All righty. Okay, folks, uh, no other questions. Uh, last call. Um, again, if you type a question in the question box, make sure you hit return. Otherwise, I will not see it. Or if you got a mic connected, you want to ask a question that way, uh, raise your little, uh, raise your hand, your electronic hand. I'll unmute you, and you can uh, go ahead and do that. Um, all right. Um, I oh, I want to make one comment. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I, what, what happened last time is I got a lot of requests for, uh, can I get a copy? Um, so your webinar is going to be posted online, right? Uh, that's correct, yes. Okay. If uh, yeah, because because this thing is like uh, 60 meg, so I can't exactly email it to you. And uh, also, if uh, if it's okay with you, Doug, uh, we've had requests for other webinars that people want to show at um, club meetings, and they don't have an internet connection. So um, I can either send you a copy of it on a CD, or if you have an FTP site, I can uh, send the file. But it's typically 60 to 80 megs. Um, but uh, we can uh, share it that way as well. So, well, okay. Why don't you go ahead and uh, send the presentation roll back to me? Uh, we will wrap this up, and uh, everyone can can get on their way. Okay, Ken. Thanks so very just, much. Uh, hang with us, folks, for one more minute. Appreciate everybody's time. Let me switch this over. Quick, quick, quick. Alrighty, and I am going to. There we go. Okay, Doug, uh, thanks once again uh, for uh, agreeing to do this. Uh, it's uh, very entertaining, a uh, great presentation, and I think uh, even more importantly, it just uh, kind of preserves some of the uh, early history of uh, contesting, and I'm, I'm glad to, to see that being done uh, because a lot of good uh, stuff uh, took place back then. Uh, as we just said, uh, this event has been recorded, and uh, it will be posted on the uh, PBRC webpage under the webinar link. I will uh, send it to our webmaster uh, probably tomorrow. I don't know how soon he'll be able to get it up, but uh, I will get it to him tomorrow. I'm uh, leaving for EY8 on Friday, so maybe I'll uh, catch some of you from uh, over there if I get a chance to get on the air. But uh, I want to get this to the uh, webmaster before I leave. Uh, also, the uh, next event is uh, September 24th, and uh, Dean had such a good time with the uh, first one he did. Uh, he came back and uh, said, hey, how about if we... Uh, uh, do another uh, webinar, and what this is kind of interesting because what he's going to do is take a volunteer, uh, look them up on qrz.com, get their uh, get their location, get the uh, GPS coordinates, do a terrain file, and just uh, build out the whole thing from there from uh, uh, from scratch. So uh, if anyone's uh, looking uh, to uh, you know how, how to uh, set up terrain files and uh, and uh, that whole thing, uh, Dean's going to step through. Uh, step through it from uh, from beginning all the way uh, through the end. And uh, since I don't have the uh, link up yet for registration on the uh, PVRC webpage, uh, most of you probably saw it announced on contesting.com and qrz.com and a few other places. But if you need the registration link, just uh, drop me an email at uh, k4zw at comcast.net, and I'll send you the link uh, that you can register. But that's, uh, again, September 24th at 8 p.m. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, glad uh, glad you could do that. Uh, Doug, uh, great job. Uh, again, thank you. And uh, look forward to seeing everyone next time. Uh, have a good evening, good morning, uh, wherever you are. So long. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm.